God's compassion. We should praise God that He is compassionate, desiring that all people turn from their sins and be saved. Here's Gene. This principle actually comes from the lives of the last four kings of Judah. So let's take a look at these one by one. Second Chronicles 36, 2 Chronicles 36.2, Jehoahaz. Jehoahaz was 23 years old when he became king, and he reigned three months in Jerusalem. We're not really told all the specifics about that, but that was a pretty short reign as far as uh, his kingship is concerned. And in Second Kings, we actually read that he did what was evil in the Lord's sight. In other words, during those three months that he was the king, uh, he didn't uh, posture himself in such a way that he was uh, making changes that would please, be pleasing to the Lord. <coughs> Second Chronicles 36, uh, 5. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. And again, we have this statement that we see again and again uh, throughout, obviously, the kings of Israel, but also, in this case, many of the kings of Judah. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. Next, we have Second uh, Chronicles 36.9. And you can see that here in the Chronicles, these uh, stories are summarized rather quickly in these last four. Jehoiachin was 18 years old when he became king. He reigned three months and ten days in Jerusalem, another short term. But also, he did what was evil in the Lord's sight. And then we come to the final king before they were taken into captivity, and this was Zedekiah. He was 21 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord his God, and did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet at the Lord's command. In other words, uh, a prophet came, the great prophet Jeremiah prophesied to him, told him what he needed to do, and he didn't respond to that. In fact, uh, he really uh, went from bad to worse. We read he became obstinate. Obstinate. And hardened his heart against returning to Yahweh, the God of Israel. All the leaders of the priests and the people multiplied their unfaithful deeds, imitating all the detestable practices of the nations. And they defiled the Lord's temple that he had consecrated in Jerusalem. Again, we have this horrible story of deterioration, of idolatry, and of evil that, was, that happened as a result of, of these kings and leading uh, the children of Israel astray. And of course, this was the final step. As far as God was concerned, this was the final king of Judah because following this king, uh, all Judah was taken into Babylonian captivity. The northern kingdoms, of course, were taken into captivity before by the Assyrians. And so here we have a story of, of uh, disobedience leading to these horrible situations, uh, the captivities and the judgment. Now, the one thing that I, I would like to summarize for you is that uh, Israel's kings, let's take the northern tribes, Israel's kings, ignored, despised God's message by the prophets. And here is somewhat of a summary straight statement. Before God brought judgment, notice how he warned them again and again. In Israel, the northern tribes, men like Elijah and Elisha had cried out to Israel with words of warning confirmed by miraculous signs. In other words, remember Elijah. They're confronting Ahab. This, this king of the north, a northern, of the northern tribes. And uh, the miraculous manifestation of, of God showing them to, challenging them to make a choice to worship God or worship the Baals. But notice, Israel had also heard God's message through Jonah, through Amos, and Hosea. You see, God didn't suddenly just descend on them with judgment. He warned them again and again, and again. Now the same thing is true as far as Judah is concerned. Judah's kings ignored, despised God's message by the prophets. Not all of them. We've seen there were good ones. 
There were those who followed their father David. But many of them just ignored and despised the word of the Lord. The people of Judah heard God's exhortations through Obadiah, through Joel, through Micah, through Isaiah, through Jeremiah, through Zephaniah, and Habakkuk. All of these prophets, some we call the major prophets, some the minor prophets, but they were warned that judgment is coming, and yet they ignored the word of the Lord. So we have here coming to this end uh, a story that isn't pleasant. But the fact is that God isn't finished because God's promise, you see, to Abraham was unconditional. That promise was that uh, God was going to take them into a land. And He was going to give them that land. And they could have that land if they obeyed God. If they disobeyed, they were going to lose it. And that's exactly what happened. They lost it. And so we have the Assyrian captivity, kings of the north, the children of Israel to the north. We have the Babylonian captivity of those in the south. But, as I said, God hasn't given up on His people. And here is the way we really end the story in, in uh, Second Chronicles, with hope. And we see God's marvelous intervention in this situation. It's called the decree of Cyrus. Let me just share with you. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, notice what happened. The word of the Lord spoken through Jeremiah was fulfilled. Actually, the prophet Jeremiah said this is what was going to happen. And it was fulfilled at the end of the 70 years. Here it is. The Lord put it into the mind of King Cyrus of Persia. Now keep in mind, this is a pagan king. This demonstrates God's in control. God is sovereign. He can intervene in our lives in order to fulfill His purposes. The Lord put it into the mind of King Cyrus of Persia to issue a proclamation throughout His entire kingdom and also to put it in writing. And notice what we have. This is what King Cyrus of Persia says. And here are the exact words that were given by God to this pagan king. And this is what he wrote. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has appointed me to build him a temple at Jerusalem in Judah. Now, we need to understand that when Cyrus took over uh, as king of Persia, his philosophy of leadership was entirely different than Nebuchadnezzar's and the kings of Babylon. His philosophy was, when you take these people into captivity, you need to return them to their homes. You need to give them the power to control themselves. They were un still under the, the authority of the king of Persia, but his whole philosophy of leadership was different. And so, you see that implied in what King Cyrus said here. He says, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. Now, he's generalizing based on what he knows of the earth, and has appointed me to build him a temple at Jerusalem and Judah. In other words, God, the God of heaven. Now, what was the God of heaven or who was the God of heaven to this king? Well, he was just another God. Baal was God of the rain. Other gods had other powers. This was the God of the heaven. So he didn't understand who God was, but God had spoken to him, and so he recognized him as a God. And so he looked at his philosophy of leadership, and he said, the God of heaven has made it clear to me that the children of Israel should return to Jerusalem, and I'm supposed to build them a temple. Now, this is God working through a pagan king. Whoever among you of his people may go up, and may the Lord his God be with him. This is God speaking through this king. And you know, today, as we look at God's message of love and compassion, uh, we have the same 
wonderful thing happening in relationship to God's compassion, God's concern, and the fact of the matter is, that's why he hasn't returned. His plan is still unfolding. And what is his plan? We'll look at 2 Peter 3, nine. The Lord does not delay His promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. You see God's patience in the Old Testament. You see God's plan unfolding through His sovereign plan, through His control, through His ultimate desire for people to come to believe. He made a promise to Abraham that they would have a land, they would have a people, and ultimately the Messiah would come. So he's releasing them from captivity so his plan can continue and ultimately to give birth to the Messiah, the Savior. We've been living in that era for about 2,000 years, the age of the church, and he still hasn't come back as Jesus promised he would. Why? He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So the question that comes to us is simply this. In what ways should God's patience and compassion toward all humanity affect the way we live as Christians in this world? Well, we could spend a lot of time on that. Let me just give you a few suggestions. Number one is be alert to our... Be, we need to be about our Father's business. Jesus taught us that when his parents were very upset with him when he was there in the temple, even at 12, he said, well, mustn't I be about my father's business? And there's a great lesson for that. Why are we here? To be about our father's business. To be light, to be salt in this world. To be a witness in this world. To be a part of this great redemptive plan. Part of that means living a godly life and demonstrating the love and unity that exists within the family of God in order to communicate who Jesus Christ really is to the world. And to be active in our churches, particularly active in not only creating the family of God that God wants to be one in Him so that the world will believe that Jesus Christ came from the Father, but also to be a part of supporting the outreach of our churches because... The Great Commission has been given to us. We are to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that Christ has taught us. And His plan for that to take place, originally through the apostles, but the establishing of local churches and communities all over the world so that we can be a witness and a light within that community and to help our churches continue to carry out the great commission of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here is the culminating principle from Second Chronicles. God's compassion. We should praise God that He is compassionate, desiring that all people turn from their sins and be saved.